As of today, there are roughly seven yoga studios on or in walking distance of the H Street Corridor in Northeast DC. Now, for those of you in Brooklyn, Portland, San Francisco, or Austin, this might sound perfectly normal. And I'm not here to attack the now commercialized ancient Hindi practice, but this very same strip of road now also boasts a Whole Foods, is the first and currently the only road for DC's streetcar, and it hosts more luxury condos and apartments per square block than probably any other artery in the entire city. Now, all of this looks great, especially for those who get to see it from behind bus windows as they ride to and from Union Station since this street is part of the main thoroughfare into and out of the city. And for the residents who've had to suffer through the decades of dilapidation and crime that's existed in this area as a result of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination in 68, which of course brought about an angry uprising in major cities like this one, on the surface, there appears to be a sense of relief that after over 50 years, this neighborhood is finally a place worth visiting and even better, worth living in. In fact, it's a place where they put yoga studios now. But we all now know that this neighborhood, not unlike most other urban neighborhoods in this country, wasn't completely ignored all those years by the powers that be. It was rather endured. See, because this type of renovation or improvement or what feels like a deforestation, it takes planning. It takes strategy. It's a process. And it requires the one commodity that we all tend to overlook. Time. Now, longtime nurse Maggie Williams's family was one that had lived around here for the better part of the century. So when the city announced its intention to give some much needed attention to Maggie's seemingly forgotten about neighborhood, of course, she, like everybody else in the row of houses that line those main and side streets, was excited. Finally, there'd be grocery stores, places to eat, places to shop, and places for overall better well-being. But, sadly, right when things were just about to start looking better, at age 92, Maggie died. That was in 2009. By 2016, barely seven years after her death, 80% of her neighbors, many of whom, like Maggie, had lived through everything from desegregation to the inauguration of the country's first black president, were gone before Obama even turned in his keys. Because just the talk of fancy grocery stores, chic shops, and elite fitness clubs attracts a certain clientele one that will pay a premium to live nearby in walking distance from all these things they need. Sure, maybe a few of the Williams' original neighbors, ignorant to the meaning of market value, sold their homes, split the money, and went about their business. But from the moment the idea crossed the first desk of a city official, probably sometime way back in the 80s, about giving much needed attention to this old drug-infested neighborhood, this guaranteed result of this eventual plan was reflected in the neighborhood's property value and thus its property taxes. So, 
as their neighbors, seemingly strategically, started to look quite different from the ones who were there the past few decades, the Williamses began to realize something. The fancy grocery stores, those are very expensive. The chic restaurants, well, they serve very unfamiliar foods. And the boutiques, well, they carried a different kind of style than the Williamses were used to. That's because the shops, the restaurants, the yoga, it ain't for people like the Williamses. Not even a full year after Maggie was in the ground, the Williamses, being one of the families who owned their home, chose to cash in on the Victorian, becoming yet another pivotal piece in the shifting of demographics in an area that actually helped epitomize DC's nickname, Chocolate City. Because unbeknownst to them, that old rundown house was actually prime real estate. Now, instead of being a single family home, the brilliant capitalist who purchased it from them gutted it down to the frame and efficiently sectioned it into three apartment units, which meant three sets of residents. And one of these residents was Antonia Cologne, a yoga instructor. Antonia wasn't unlike many of DC's fairly new residents. She came for college at American University, figured she'd stay for a high paying government job afterward. But now, eight years post graduation, she was on her third career, but finally doing something she actually loved. And this was the story she was telling the guy she was sitting across from at dinner. Now, perhaps it was because of her line of work, such an intimate, peaceful wellness field, or maybe her innate personality type. She was a sweet, often soft-spoken girl who liked to laugh a lot, often making guys think they were much funnier than they actually were, or whatever the case. She thought to herself, just 10 minutes into this first date, that she always seemed to end up with guys like this ones that didn't excite her and in whom she had no real interest. Now, she was very outgoing and she dated an awful lot. She was not particularly prejudiced about men's physical appearance and would date across the racial and height spectrum. And as a very smart, fit, interesting, and beautiful woman of Irish-Spanish descent, it was fairly easy for her to do so. So, it was odd to keep finding herself bored while in the company of men who looked so good on paper. Now, they'd met a few weeks back at the Susan G. Coleman Breast Cancer 5K. She was volunteering, signing people in. She remembered him because he spelled his name Solo Man. Now, it was pronounced Solomon, but spelled like Solo Man. And she'd never seen that name spelled that way before. She thought it was rather unique and wondered if it was revealing something about his personality. So she asked him out, mostly because he couldn't seem to spit it out himself. But she noticed something within the first 10 minutes. He was nice, but too nice. And yes, there is such a thing as too nice. Too nice in this particular instance was code for having no distinctive personality, desires, or opinions, but often trying too hard to accommodate or mirror those set or implied by the woman, and usually doing so with no or very little confidence. Women generally hate this, 
Antonia hated this. But he was awfully cute. And it had been almost three weeks. She needed an orgasm and preferably one with another person in the room. So she invited him up. Now, to her surprise, he was much better than she expected. So much so that she agreed to see him again. But see, the thing is, he was really starting to like her a lot. And she could sense this. But he was nice, much too nice to ask if she could continue seeing him and maybe two other guys because she needed more than he alone was capable of giving her. The two of them simply wanted different things. And she saw this. He, on the other hand, was obviously choosing not to. Because he had heard the things women said about men, and he prided himself on being the exception. But with all the talk about what women really wanted, where did that leave men like Solomon? Well, after a month, Antonia took his calls less and less, and she left longer and longer time between responses to his text. Until one day, yesterday, in fact, Solomon finally accepted that they were never going to see each other again. I'm Kayana Ebony Brown, and this is a story of music and men. Standing here alone Your light can set me free Your waves go crashing down After lunch at Busboys earlier that afternoon with the girls, I left with Jay's words stuck in my head. You need to get laid. See, the truth is that my line of work puts me in direct contact with all kinds of men all the time. Granted, they're mostly rappers, singers, and wannabe rockers. Hence, the reason why I almost never have second dates. And then there were guys like him. The reason for my lack of first dates. Now the him I'm referring to was the owner of two of the most beautiful brown eyes I have ever seen in all my life. Which I found myself staring into as he helped me to retrieve the mess that had fallen out of my bag and onto the floor of the high-end electronic store showroom. Now after leaving Jay and Ty earlier, I hopped on the metro and headed all the way across town in the direction of my afternoon meeting. But instead, I found myself loitering inside the tech superstore before I suddenly and mindlessly collided with a so-called genius running by, spilling my entire bag onto the floor. The smarty pants didn't even stop to help me gather my things. Now, the aforementioned him with the deep brown eyes, the skin like Godiva, and the beard. And look, I, I have a thing for beards. And the curly faded haircut was a customer just waiting to be waited on. I hadn't even noticed him until he was already down on the floor in front of me, helping to collect the CDs and other mess that had fallen out of my bag. Now this could have been it. My chance to be transparent. That thing I said to Jay at lunch earlier, talking to guys required too much of. But it was as if all of the possible words I could have said had fallen onto the floor too. And I was having trouble picking them up as well. 
It felt like an eternity down there with him on the floor, blanketed by silence. I kept wanting to find those beautiful brown eyes of his again, but I forced myself to focus on the floor in front of me, because, of course, that was important, right? After the five seconds or so that it took, I stood up first and he followed, handing me one last disc. I realized right then that I must have also spilt my breath out onto the floor too when I dropped my things because my lungs were empty. But I somehow managed to graciously mumble, thanks, thank you. And as usual in situations like this, I had no idea what to do, what to say or what to do with my hands. I clumsily leaned onto a tablet or something, causing it to make a noise, which then caused even more anxiety as he smiled and gave a quiet, you're welcome, just as a saleswoman approached saying that she could help him. I stood there and I watched. I watched him walk away, still wanting to say something, but only wishing that I already had. I even started to come up with little scenarios in my head like, what if I waited outside until he was finished and accidentally, but of course not so accidentally, bumped into him again. Only this time I would- I'm all done, you ready? Interrupted Solomon, my good friend, who, by the way, I didn't think was so good at the moment, as he stepped right in front of me, blocking my view of the guy who I will, from this point on until I learn his name, referred to as Dream Guy. Reluctantly, I nodded yes, that I was ready to go, because I now had no real reason for being in that store. But as we walked toward the exit, I certainly wasn't going to leave without getting one last look at him before I left. Mm. Needing a new motherboard and fan economically made Solomon no sense went on and on, justifying to me why he had just purchased this new laptop he was carrying as we strolled down a bustling rush hour street in Georgetown. As a group of people holding signs, some with Maduro or a Venezuelan flag, breezed by us in the same direction. When I told him that I'd be in his part of town that evening, Solomon insisted that I meet him for tapas or coffee or both. The last thing I wanted to do was spend money on a new laptop, but they couldn't save my old lady, so I had to pull the plug. The sales guy was happy to introduce me to something new, though. He glanced down at the bag he was holding. Huh? She's much thinner and she's fast and easy, just like I like them, he said with a facetious smile. Now, at first glance, it's hard to tell whether my boy Solomon is nerdy or just nice. But in fact, he's both. Solomon Dial is actually one of DC's genuinely nice single guys, a successful nonprofit tech entrepreneur whose company just secured its second round of financing, but whose unsuccessful love life perpetually kept him caught between a rock and a bunch of women used to making bad choices. Yeah. A very hard place. Women almost always immediately notice how attractive he is as soon as they meet him. The thing is, though, he doesn't know it. He never dressed like he knew it, wearing khakis, sneakers, and flannel shirts with the sleeves rolled up all the time like it was his uniform. And he didn't carry himself like he knew it, standing with a slight hunch probably from slouching in front of the computer all the time. His smooth, cashew-brown skin, jet-black hair, and almond-shaped eyes were what attracted women to him, though. He's of Indian descent, but was born here, in the States, Aberdeen, Maryland, to be exact, to parents of very modest means. Needless to say, they were quite proud of their little owner of a successful nonprofit startup in D.C., but that hadn't stopped them from questioning him about grandchildren, or the opportunity to introduce him to and I quote, a nice Indian girl. By the way, how are things going with uh, that uh, yoga instructor you were all excited about a few weeks ago? He took one of those deep breaths filled with frustrated emotions <sighs> and then answered, let's just say I'll be spending tonight trying to hit the right buttons on this little beauty. It's so easy to figure out what a computer's doing. And when you can't, all you have to do is force quit and start over. I reminded him, computers are man-made, my friend. Yeah, if only... Dude, you know what? I swear to God, if I find out Siri and you are more than just friends and you're going all Joaquin Phoenix from her on me, <laughs> I'm disowning you. <laughs> and this triggered a real hearty laugh from him. I could tell he probably hadn't laughed like that all day. 
My attention, though, was immediately taken by the music coming from across the street in the direction of the Venezuelan embassy. It was a familiar jazz meets hip-hop sound that I had discovered online one day while listening to an indie music station as I worked. What, you know him? That's Willie Ortega, Venezuelan violin player who spoke out against tyranny with his instrument. And he was tortured there, beaten, burned, hunted down. He fled here to the States. Now, he's a symbol of his people's struggle. Man, dude's story is amazing. All because he took a figurative knee with his violin, Solomon chimed in. Now he was watching too as the growing crowd outside the place became more excited. And look at that crowd. I guess you find your people, go to where they are, give them what they want. He commented as more pedestrians were being drawn in. Kenya? An unfamiliar and unexpected voice was calling my name. I turned to see a scruffy white dude who could have been 19 or 39 walking toward me. I spotted you, you know, the hair, as he stopped right in front of me. My big hair had become like vanity license plates. I met this guy only once before and it was a few months ago, but I did recognize him as he got closer, extending his hand out for a shake. I obliged and wasted no time getting right down to business. Dante, hey, I was actually just on my way over to meet up with you. Please tell me you can get my boy on that stage this weekend. Well, I can get you the person that can get you to the one in charge who should be able to help you, he said as he took a folded piece of paper from his back pocket and handed it to me. This is it? I was looking at a couple of names and a couple of numbers. You could have just texted me this. Look, I don't text things that might come back to bite me in the ass, okay? Ain't nothing here but some names of the guy across the street from the club. He said as if it was obvious. He's your eyes. And the guy with the keys, he lets you in. It's simple. I just kept staring at the paper as if I was expecting something else to appear there that made more sense to me. <coughs> I quickly looked up at him as he rubbed his thumb and his first two fingers together an apparent indication that he desired some money for this. So I just said, you know what? Brandon got you, implicating the mutual friend who had introduced us. But he wasn't having it. I guess it was like going to a store and telling them that your friend would pay for the stuff later. So after I realized that he wasn't buying it anyway, I began searching around my pockets. Look, five bucks. It's all I have. Handing him a few bowled up one dollar bills. He looked at Solomon, perhaps hoping he would co-sign for me. But Solomon confirmed his non-involvement by just sipping his coffee and continuing to watch the musician across the street. Dante decided to take my crumpled five, but as he left, he made one last request. Tell your boy Brandon he fucking knows me. Solomon and I watched him walk off. <sighs> Man, why the hell is everything in your business so damn sketchy? Is it supposed to be this difficult? Shh. I've been asking myself that for the last four years. I admit it with exasperation. <laughs> and you want to know the downfall of running an indie label? And then Solomon responded, there's only one downfall? The best indie artists? Man, they can do what I do. So I wonder sometimes if they really need me. I hated to admit this. I absolutely love what I do. But sometimes it could feel like I was doing it all in vain. This was one of those times. But Solomon responded like the good friend that he is. Yeah, but couldn't I make the argument that there are some pretty great musicians out there who couldn't do anything without you? We found that tapas place he was telling me about, and he treated me to what could have been a late lunch or an early dinner had it actually been more than hors d'oeuvre-sized portions. I couldn't stop thinking about what Solomon had just said to me as I made my way back to the Blue Line Metro stop. There are some pretty great musicians out there who couldn't do anything, do without, anything you. without you. And honestly, he had a point.
This episode of Of Music and Men was written and produced by me, Kayana, with express permission and the help of some of the most incredible indie artists in the world. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to ofmusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. Music for this episode was provided by Filmstro, arranged and designed for this episode by me, Kayana. The song you're hearing right now is by Mona Wonderlick. And the music for your word of inspiration is Scars by Khalil Ismael. And of course, all of our promotional music is done by Khalil Ismael. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to amusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. And if you would like to have your music featured on the show, check out our website for more information on how you can submit. Now remember, Of Music and Men is so much more than just this podcast. The novella series is available in online bookstores, and if you wish to have a physical copy, you can get it on our website. Of course, that's of musicandmen.com, where you can also get t-shirts and all other kinds of cool merch. Don't forget to subscribe at Apple, Stitcher, or wherever it is you're listening to this podcast, and remember to review and give us a five-star rating. Lastly, connect with us on Patreon, where you can become part of this project and its journey and help it to grow to everything it was meant to be. Oh, and make sure to share this some way, somehow, with at least one friend, at least one. And follow Of Music and Men everywhere online at Of Music and Men. And when you do, please, don't hesitate to reach out. Artists and entrepreneurs are a very unique type. We face lots of rejection, almost too often for comfort. So, whether you're a seasoned business owner or creator, aspiring to be one, or you're simply here just to hear a great story, I want to always leave you with something to ponder until the next time. Today's words are from Robert Brolt. Inner beauty, too needs occasionally to be told it's beautiful. Even with ourselves, do we focus too much with our eyes and not enough with our heart? Next time on Of Music and Men. There are some pretty great musicians out there who couldn't do anything do without anything, you. Without you. Couldn't do anything without you. When Solomon said that, he was referring to the two diametrically opposing artists that I have on my young record label. Take Taj Kamal, for instance. She's the reason I even started this business of mine in the first place. She had music and no idea what to do with it. I was unemployed with, I guess, time to figure it out. So stepping into this warehouse-looking spot somewhere east of the river that afternoon after parting ways with Solomon, which acted as a rehearsal space because of its really unassumingly great acoustics, my eyes were instantly stapled to TK, seemingly skating around that stage in figurative concert with her band, playing to no audience, as these memories of our less-than-humble beginnings danced through my head. I stood there analyzing this entire skeleton performance how she moved, how they played off her direction with improv, how her take on hip hop perspired with the heart and grit of the 90s, but breathed with the energetic social existentialism of today. It had been four years now since she and I had become a tandem. A couple albums and a couple mixtapes later, and here we are, finishing up LP number three, and trying at least to figure out how exactly we were gonna make some money with this one. All right, that's it, take five. She said to the four others behind her, all wearing or holding different instruments. That's next time on Of Music and Men.